terrifying. Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on a, eh, eh, you know, I mean, it's, it's not terrible this morning. We are in the 70s. I don't, don't know how low we're in the 70s, but we're in the 70s. It could be worse. Uh, I have to admit, to some extent, the weather is improving a little bit. I mean, it's still hot as balls midday. Uh, but for the moment, and it could just be a phony little psyched out thing, uh, the weather seems to be a little bit better in the mornings and the evenings. I'm not quite as miserable sitting here in Peter's driveway, although it is pretty humid, I have to say, even if the temperature isn't awful. But uh, it's still too soon and not quite enough to give me any kind of real hope. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to carry on with my fingers crossed, but I think, frankly, we're still in an absolute fog of miserable shit that's on the way, and I just haven't, you know, I haven't aligned to where I feel like it's getting better yet. It's, I'm like an abused person, you know? I mean, the, the weather beats you up enough over the summer that you're not quite ready to accept that it might be improving, and I think that's where I'm at. Uh, that said, it also might not be improving. And anyway, you guys don't want to hear all this crap. Uh, the birds have been insane around here this morning. They've been tweeting, angry, weird. Uh, I haven't seen too many, but, you know, I know they're just lurking behind the foliage waiting to waiting to do their business. And, you know, I talked earlier about my lady friend's bird feeder, which, again, I mean, you want to talk about a giant wet shit on my head. Uh, you know, of all things in the world for her to decide to put in the yard, she puts a bird feeder, not just one, but two of them. And uh, I posted a video on Twitter, the little quick thing that I took, uh, showing exactly what it is that I'm putting up with. And I'll interject it now or inject it, whatever it is. I'll put it in so you can see what the hell is going on over there. Yeah, so there you go. It's like a Hitchcock movie. Uh, you know, the birds are up in the trees. There's thousands of them. Uh, they're angry. They've got sharp beaks. And every time I walk to or from the house, I feel like this is going to be the last time. Uh, and of course, again, this is the way the people in my life treat me. These are the people that are supposed to like me. So, you know, the ones who don't. I probably like them better. But anyway, uh, in other news, Chris, the worst human on earth. I've talked about him before. Well, he's moving in next door uh, to my shop, which is just fantastic. It's like having a 230-pound, high-tone, perverted block captain, you know, barking complaints at you about your parking job uh, while smoking a blunt and wearing bright yellow tennis shoes and a T-shirt that looks like, you know, a lady's medium. Uh the, you know, in fact, it's not like that. It is exactly that. And that's what's going on. So now I get to be miserable at home uh, and miserable at work as well. I just know it's not going to end well, you know, probably with gunplay. Uh, I also forgot my video camera today. So I'm doing this entirely on the iPhone, which I haven't done before. And I don't know if it's going to work. So this whole video could be for not, but we'll see. Well, I mean, obviously it's going to work. It's a video camera, but... You know, I just don't like change. I really, really don't. And uh, that's where I'm at right now. But uh, yeah, anyway, we're going to keep going. Uh, I did a plane review, as some of you know. Uh, that was the last thing I did, that old Cessna. 
and uh, frankly, it had kind of mixed results. I mean, some people sort of liked it. Quite a few people liked it. You know, others treated it like it was that movie Apocalypto when it came. You know, what the frig is this? Uh, but uh, frankly, I enjoyed it, and I do another if and when the time comes. And you know, I'd also do a boat or a train or whatever other mechanical contrivance kind of catches my fancy. Because I mean, why the hell not? I'll be dead soon, you know. Christ, I'm over 50 now. I'm not the healthiest guy on earth. Uh, I can't imagine I have too many years left, so I may as well do anything that amuses me. And, uh, you know, it's the same reason I might go to an Asian massage. It's just, you know, you got to keep yourself happy. And uh, so if another plane comes around, I might do it. But it was fun. Again, I didn't die. Uh, you know, the pilot, the very old guy, very bad hand tremors, but uh, I did manage to make it through. And, uh, you know, again, I post some of this stuff up on Twitter. It wouldn't That plane review wouldn't have been a surprise to anyone who's following over there. So, you know, if you're at all inclined or you're not philosophically opposed to it, uh, head over to Twitter and sign up for Curious Cars and you'll get some sneak peek stuff of what's coming. And uh, I just find it to be a friendlier chat board platform. Uh, you know, and pretty good for, you know, getting stuff out before the fact, not after the fact. So anyway, there it is. But look, let's move on to this. You know, for all the new people come on, I say, what the hell is this idiot talking about? You know, I came here to look at a car. Believe me, I sympathize. And this is a Mercedes-Benz 300 CD. Uh, it's a coupe. It's built on the famous executive class W123 platform. This one is a coupe, so it's a C123, but basically the same shit. Uh, it's a car people can and have written books about, like thick books. So, you know, given that, I'm going to try to keep it reasonably short, but no guarantees. Simply put, uh, the W123 in any of the many forms that it came in uh, was the pinnacle of post-war German engineering. In many ways, it is automotive perfection, uh, the likes of which really hasn't been seen before or since and uh, probably will never be again. I mean, no, no car built before or after has been as perfect at its intended purpose. Well, at the risk of inviting debate and ridicule, I'd offer one possible exception, and that would be the first generation Mazda Miata. But don't get angry. We'll cover that another time. Uh, but otherwise, I just think this is as perfect a car that has ever been made. And bear in mind, uh, this design, uh, you know, when it was started, uh, for the perfect machine, as genuinely good a vehicle that has ever been built, uh, came just about 20 years or so after Mercedes-Benz and Germany was essentially bombed out of existence. Uh, I mean, they had absolutely nothing. The company was essentially over, and uh, they didn't just have to rebuild their product line. They had to rebuild every factory and every supply. You know, they had nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing after World War II. And here, just 20-odd years later, they build what could arguably be called the most perfect car ever made. And uh, it was really only five or 10 years, not yeah, a few years after, you know, one couldn't buy a Mercedes without being sort of suspect as a Nazi sympathizer or something. And, uh, you know, this car came, yeah, right about when that was, you know, on the way out after the uh, start of the European Union in the early 70s, you know, all of a sudden, the Brits are starting to take vacation on the continent or vacations and, you know, German cars are kind of starting to be a little bit more accepted. But uh, there was a time before that when you just couldn't have bought one. And, uh, you know, that was that was the circumstance that Mercedes was designing these cars under. Uh, more than any other, this car globally redeemed Mercedes-Benz in the eyes of the automotive world and frankly also served as an ambassador for kind of a newer, friendlier post-war Germany. Uh, you know, it wasn't just for Mercedes-Benz that this car was so important, uh, but it was also, you know, it sort of, it was so good that it said, look, man, you know, yeah, Germany did some stuff, but this car is so good, we got to buy it anyway. And that was an important thing for them. Uh, it was built under the company's slogan, engineered like no other car in the world. And uh, this is one of those rare cases where hype and reality were kind of perfectly synchronized. Uh, the design was by an incredible guy, a famed legend at Mercedes-Benz named Bruno Sacco. And he also had input from another 
legendary Mercedes designer named Friedrich uh, uh, Geiger, the guy who designed the R107. And the two of them came together and made this thing. And it was just an absolute masterpiece of understatement and still a departure from kind of the somber designs of Mercedes past. It, it just was absolutely perfect in every way for the time that it came out. Uh, it was a luxury car, it was expensive, uh, but it was far from the rolling bordellos sort of considered to be luxurious at the time. You know, the, the Cadillacs with uh, crushed velvet interiors and opera lights and, you know, that's, it was not that kind of luxury at all. Uh, it was extremely understated inside and out. And the luxury came from the intense attention given to engineering every detail of the car to be sort of top quality. Um, the quality of the drivetrain, the smoothness of the suspension, the feel of the steering wheel, the switch gear, uh, the comfort of the seats, the advanced safety features for the time. Uh, you know, that's what made the car expensive. That's what made it feel luxurious. And uh, it's just a different world that than it is now or then. You know, while most other companies at the time weren't terribly concerned about longevity uh, or keeping occupants free from harm, Mercedes built this forever car. You know, one that could take an owner as far as they wanted to go for as long as they wanted to do it. Uh, all while being safer than most other cars on the road and broadcasting enough a badge glamour to keep the upper crust satisfied. Uh, everyone at the time knew these cars were expensive, well-built, and uh, owned by discriminating people that, you know, had pretty fat wallets. They were a statement with build quality to back it up, which again is kind of rare. And uh, even though not all 123s were built to impress, uh, it was an incredibly versatile platform. Uh, it came as a sedan, it came as a coupe like this one, it came as a wagon. Uh, there were also limousines which were run around by the heads of state and that sort of thing. Uh, and that chassis, that limousine chassis, opened the door to specialty uh, vehicles like, you know, police cars, ambulances, fire trucks, panel vans. Most prolifically, the industrial or commercial use for these things was taxis. Uh, there was a time when an absolute sea of these light ivory uh, 123s could be seen outside every airport or city center in Europe or even globally. This is the actual color for it, by the way. And uh, they, they, most of them were running 24 hours a day with three different shifts of driver. I mean, they were just that much of a departure from the other cars at the time. And they were the first, or at least one of the very first, to have an odometer that ran to 999,000 miles, a statement of expectation uh, it would prove accurate, you know, there's a, and now of course every car has that, but uh, this was uh, really one of the first that made a point out of it. Uh, and as I said before, it was the perfect car. Uh, I love the wagons. That was my thing. And I've done a few reviews on wagon one. I've done, look, I'll link in the description. I've done a bunch of these things. I love them. I probably shouldn't do another one because it's already been covered, but you know, this one presented itself from Dave the Wholesaler. Great guy. Love him. He's given me some fantastic stuff to review. In fact, this one's going to be on Bring a Trailer, I believe, uh, in a few weeks. So uh, one of the rare cases, he's not wholesaling to dealers, but actually uh, going to put it up for retail. So if you have an interest in it, keep an eye on Bring a Trailer. You'll see it soon. 40,000 miles on this thing. It's probably the nicest Coupe 123 I've seen in decades, if not ever. So, uh, But I was the wagon guy. You know, I thought that was... It was a departure for me. They had ignored the wagon market for some time. And then all of a sudden, they yeah, had the hell with it. Look, we got this platform. Let's make a wagon out of it. And it was launched to immediate success. I mean, there was already a waiting list for uh, any 123 when they came out. But uh, the wagon was absolutely insane. Uh, it became the most desirable wagon on the market. Extremely prestigious. Prestigious enough that quite a few of the first year, the first releases, at least in Europe, uh, were all owned by celebrities. It's not rare at all to find one that was owned by, like, one of the Bee Gees or something. Uh, but look, anyway, I've rolled on about, you know, how great these things are <laughs> for a moment. I'm going to catch my breath, uh, and then uh, I think I'll have a little coronavirus whiskey. What the hell? I didn't have enough this morning. And then we're going to jump into this particular coupe. So bear with me one moment. 
All right, so let's have a look at this specific one, which again is absolutely gorgeous and has been a treat to drive around. I mean, as a guy who's a bit of a fan of the early, or at least the 80s Mercedes, more so than the 70s, honestly, although this is essentially a 70s car uh, in its roots, uh, it's been such a fun thing to feel one that's so close to new in terms of the way it looks, feels, and drives. And I've just been enjoying the absolute hell out of it. And again, thanks, Dave. <laughs> You know, uh, I really do appreciate the stuff you're giving me. Uh, this is a 1983, again, 300 CD. Uh, it's a Mercedes pillarless coupe, which is a tradition that had been going and kept going for a while. Um, it, the coupes are comparatively rare when we're talking about, well, look, they made 2.7 million W123s. It's Mercedes' most prolific model uh, over the course of like 10 years, 75 to 85 roughly. And of those, not quite 100,000 of them were built, the coupes, uh, meaning that they make up like 4% or less than 4% of uh, all the W123s built, these C123s. Uh, it was meant for a fluent, empty nest basically, at least in the U.S. and probably Europe as well. Um, you know, kind of intended for use for having intensely ugly and sophisticated arguments between man and wife uh, while driving to dinner at the country club or meeting the Joneses for drinks in the city or whatever. Uh, it's undeniably attractive. Um, you know, you could give Bruno Sacco some credit for that, but it's far from beautiful, really. I mean, it's a personal luxury coupe uh, based on what's essentially a rugged industrial platform. I mean, it's like putting leather and a sunroof in a blender. Uh, the coupe topped out the price list, even though it had fewer parts, basically, than the sedans or wagons or anything else. Uh, but my favorite part of it, it has these frameless... The, sort of the frameless glass and no pillars. So, you know, when you put down the four uh, windows, the, you know, two side windows on either side, it's just a giant big bit of air, you know, through the whole top greenhouse of the car. It reminds me of the 60s or 70s, uh, you know, American luxury coupes before the rollover standard sort of called for B pillars and more roof support. You know, Mercedes put a lot of roof structure in it to make it sound and, you know, well exceed safety standards while still having no pillar in the middle. And I think it just looks absolutely gorgeous. It's got a neutral and functional design. Uh, again, it's not as imposing uh, as earlier Benzes or stodgy, but it's not quite friendly either. You know, I mean, it just, some people call it a masterpiece of understatement. Some people say it's just too vanilla and, you know, neutral. And, you know, I'm somewhere in between. I can appreciate the neutrality of it. Uh, you've got the five mile an hour bumpers. You wouldn't have had those in Europe. They're uh, a lot shorter there, but that was an American thing. They're fine with me. Uh, but the European guys don't love them. Uh, you've got a traditional grill, the Mercedes grill with the hood star on top. Uh, you know, I've said it many times, but I like to every time. Uh, the three points on the star count for domination on land, sea, and air. And, you know, if that's not a vicious German logo or, you know, emblem, I don't know what is. Uh, it's got very subtle body lines at a time when that was expensive. You know, the lovely round curvature in the hood. It's great. We've got helicopters flying around. Uh, but, uh, you know, a very nice bit of curvature in the hood. You've got these sort of composite headlamps up front. They're, they're the American version as the sealed beams and the two yellow fogs in the middle, which I think look cool. Uh, big impact strip on the bumper. Uh, fill, you know, bumper fillers and rubber that serve a good function. Uh, they call these bunt cake alloy wheels for obvious reasons. They, you know, look a little bit like a bunt cake, and that was a Mercedes fixture. fixture. Uh, big impact strip down the side that, again, serves a purpose, has rubber and chrome trim, and looks nice. Uh, you know, chrome around all the windshield and window openings that looks good, or at least polished uh, 
aluminum, stainless, whatever. Uh, pillar mounted mirrors, chrome caps on them that look terrific. Uh, the Daimler, Daimler Ben sticker that's really famous on these cars, you know, signed off on. Uh, little vents on the cowl there. Uh, pull to open door handles that were a safety thing at the time and, uh, you know, look great. Uh, you know, even the gas door on the coupe is different from the other ones, which again makes these things hard to restore so if you're going to get one you probably want to get a good one because you're going to spend a fortune otherwise uh going to the back you've got this sort of nice mid height mounted deck lid that uh again doesn't you know stand out in any kind of design way but it's perfectly functional and conceals a trunk that's really useful um I like the uh, chrome or, again, the aluminum trim around the back window. Uh, you've got these ridge taillights. That's a Mercedes feature. Uh, that's designed so mud or snow or that sort of thing doesn't build up and block your taillights if you're tooling through the desert or, you know, a very snowy day in the Swiss Alps. Uh, you've got the Mercedes-Benz alphanumeric nomenclature, you know, 300 CD. <sighs> I'm mixed on this because I've always thought it was cool on Mercedes-Benz products, but it became a thing that everyone else sort of tried to copy. And even Cadillac, you know? I mean, Cadillac should make Eldorados, not Ecstasies or whatever the hell they're making. And I kind of blame Mercedes for that. But the alphanumeric thing is kind of cool. And, you know, it's very simple. You know, for some people, it's... It, it, it looks a little bit impo. Oh my God! What does this mean or that mean or the? I, okay, the th basically the number at the front denotes the engine size, or at least this is true for Mercedes of this era. Uh, most of them, anyway. So being a 300 CD, it means that this thing has a three liter engine, which it does. The diesel engine. Uh, the C stands for coupe. If it was a sedan, it would have nothing. They didn't designate sedan. They just designated coupes and wagons. The C for coupe, the T for wagon, and uh, the D, uh, of course, is for diesel. Uh, if this were one of the rare gas cars in America, or, you know, they're more prolific in Europe, it would have an E, like a 280E or a 240E or that sort of thing. And uh, that was a word for... Uh, that basically meant fuel injection. It was ein Spritzen or something it stood for, which, you know, again, it means fuel injection, but it kind of sounds like you've wandered in this dark German corner of Pornhub or something. Uh, it's just a little bit freaky. So uh, anyway, look, let's have a little bit. Yeah, I'm going to look inside. I'm going to look inside the trunk, see what we got. I got to grab the key for that. I've got it in my pocket. I don't know why the little push button. <sighs> even though I don't think it's locked, the push button wasn't doing it. So here is a part of the perfection of the car is this perfect trunk. It's got more than enough room for livery duty. Taxi drivers can fit a ton of suitcases in there, whatever they need to put in there. Um, the, the design is just perfect. You can see this one still has the book set and some records with it. Uh, it's got the original radio that's been kept and still with the car. Um, I'm not a big fan of upgrading well, you know what? I, I am in a way, because I'd probably do the same if it was my car. But this one does have a very elegant, uh, you know, Infinity sub installed. I do also like the flat floor, which is something that wasn't going on with American cars at the time. And that is where the uh, uh, spare tire and jacking hardware and that sort of thing is mounted underneath this panel so it doesn't get in your way. And it is a full-size spare tire on a factory alloy wheel, which is just something you're never going to see. If a car even has a spare tire today, which most of them don't, you know, you got to feed some fix a flat in it with a, you know, brand logo on it. But the, if it even had one, it's not going to be on a factory spare. It's going to be on some, you know, steel donut thing. And uh, it's just a shame. Uh, there's the turbo diesel badge on the back. Um, most of these in America were diesels. And it all came together, again, perfectly because Mercedes pioneered diesels in the 1930s. You know, they basically were among the first to put diesel engines in cars. And there was a renewed interest in it in the 70s and 80s because of the gas crunch and the Arab oil embargo. And the, you know, diesels were notoriously more fuel efficient. And, uh, you know, it helped Mercedes with the cafe standards at the time. In fact, I want to say from 81 to 85, uh, the diesel was the only offering, uh, different diesels, but diesel fuel was the only offering in these cars uh, from Mercedes in North America. Uh, have a look under the hood. 
I know I do. I'm a sucker for these things, man. I really am. I really am. All right, this is kind of hard, but let's do it. Uh, okay, under the hood, more automotive perfection. I'm not going to do it, but this hood will lift up into a service position. If I click that little lever there and on the other side, I can continue to raise the hood where it's running straight up and down. And uh, that's called the service position, which makes it much easier for a mechanic to get under there and do stuff to it. And while the Mercedes gas engines don't have any particular lovely look to them, uh, I find the diesels to be absolute industrial art. I mean, I feel like this thing should be under the hood of a, you know, tiger tank or a U-boat or something. It just, you know, when you look at the way that it goes together, there was nothing else like this at the time. Uh, you know, the, the fuel lines, the, uh, the, the fuse box cover, uh, you know, everything on it is this super duty over-engineered to be, I mean, look where the oil filter goes there and the giant canister in the back that you open up. Uh, the fuel filter is spin on here as well as having an inline one there. Uh, you know, even the wing nut on top of the power steering pump there, or the, you know, cruise control actuator. I mean, it is all so intensely industrial and uh, you can absolutely see why this car was so damn expensive. Um, but anyway, you could get different gas. If you combine Europe and America, there were four cylinder gas engines, six cylinder gas engines, uh, four cylinder diesels, five cylinder diesels, diesels with turbochargers. Uh, in fact, America demanded that because frankly, the normally naturally aspirated diesel engines were just a little bit too slow for us and the turbo really woke them up. So from 81 onward, they were turbos, uh, at least in the, um, the 300 version, the 240 were still not. Uh, transmissions, there were four-speed automatics, there were four-speed manuals, some rear five-speed manuals. Uh, those pull a premium, the manual gearboxes, because there just aren't too many, certainly not in America. And uh, again, while these were industrial offerings in Europe, you know, that could be run as taxi cabs, virtually all of them in America were basically luxury cars sold to highline people. And by the time 85 rolled around, you were talking about 35 grand in 1985, incredibly expensive. Incre I mean, I think a Honda Accord at the time was about nine or 10. So, I mean, you're talking about a seriously pricey car uh, that still had manual seats <laughs> and vinyl interior. But uh, anyway, we'll get into that. Coral springs up uh, front and back. Um, the wagons had self-leveling hydraulic suspension, four-wheel disc brakes, four-wheel independent. Uh, you know, again, light years beyond the competition at the time. And, uh, you know, more like cars will be built, uh, you know, years down the road. Crumple zones front and back, an attentive eye to safety and you know, you just gotta love Mercedes-Benz. I mean, this is such, this car was built to a standard. Um, there, again, nothing like it really since. I love the cars that came after it, the 124s, the 126s, but even they were a little bit of a cheapening from the absolute over-engineered insanity of this W123. So anyway, I'm gonna pause it there for a second, then we're gonna hop in, have a look inside, and go for a spin. Bear with me one moment. All right, so let's have a look inside. Again, you got to love the uh, pulled open door handles. That was kind of a new thing at the time. Uh, these coupes, most of them had leather uh, in the United States, which was a rare interior option. Uh, the vast bulk of 123s had MB Techs, uh, a Mercedes vinyl that does a pretty nice job of impersonating leather. Uh, well, at the same time, if there's ever a nuclear holocaust, the only thing left is going to be that MB techs and cockroaches. Uh, it's just that durable. Uh, you know, the fit and finish of the car is just absolutely amazing. And again, you're talking about a car that cost well more than a Cadillac, and it was loaded up with manual adjustments. I mean, you know, Cadillacs would have dual power seats, power mirrors, power everything. This thing has dual manual seats. You see the push button there, the roller wheel, the height adjustment on the side. On the front is a handle for forward and back. Uh, this mirror is manual, uh, the driver's side, while the passenger side is power because the driver can't reach it. Uh, 
you know, that's the kind of logic that was applied to this car. Um, you know, the door latches, again, like something from a Panzer tank. Uh, listen to the way this door closes. You know, I mean, again, calling it a bank vault is not entirely unfair, and it was like no other car at the time. Uh, looking in the back, your Canadians are going to be... Yeah, chipper enough. You got uh, room for two. You got a little ashtray in the middle. You got an armrest. Uh, up on the package shelf there is a tool kit, or sorry, a medical kit, everything a wounded German might need. Uh, you got oh shit handles on either side. You got three-point seat belts because that was a safety feature. Uh, you see your window switches on the door panels and uh, these little cargo nets on the back. You can't really put a bag of drugs in there because it's going to fall out. Even a big key of cocaine is going to be a little bit too obvious. So that's pretty terrible drug storage and frankly your gun storage in there isn't going to work too well either but uh yeah i guess you could put a map in there if you wanted to or some kind of bag of chips uh but otherwise you know everything nice you could see the uh, uh being a coupe they had to put the uh top of the three-point belts here up on the top of that rear um uh, door panel that continued on uh, later iterations of these mercedes coupes had power uh, seat belt presenters that would shoot out and make it easier to grab. I love the big chrome caps they use. Uh, these sort of felt liners for weather strip. Uh, big scuff plate there. The, again, big chrome cap over here. I mean, look at that door latch. I mean, there's, again, there's just nothing like this. It's a very unique build quality at the time that's light years from anything Mercedes even produces today. Uh, drugs or guns, you have a better time putting them in there. Nice little plastic thing. Oh, these, these things break because people use their feet on them. Very often you'll see a split in that. And uh, like the big uh, Mercedes floor mat with the heel pad. And we hop in and got a little bit of sun coming in. So I'm going to fire it up and roll forward. Uh, to do that, the key is up here on the dash under the cluster, not on the column like it is in a lot of cars. Uh, you turn the key to ignition and then you see that glow plug light. When that goes out, engine's ready to start and that uh, big diesel fires to life. Let me roll forward into the shade. I'll give you a little tour in here. Okay, so again, all this stuff was a little bit of a departure. Here is a uh, nice three-gauge cluster. God, getting out of the sun is impossible. There we go. Uh, there's a nice three-gauge cluster. Well, it's actually more gauges, but three-hole, three-round cluster. Uh, you've got your uh, water temp, you've got your fuel, uh, and you got your oil pressure there. Uh, in the middle, you got 120 mile an hour speedo. You see just 41,000 miles of the clock in this thing. Incredible. And uh, over there is your tack. Uh, which is, seems pretty high for a diesel and a uh, clock. Uh, here's your wipers, here's your cruise control switch, here's a uh, headlight switch Mercedes had been using for years, this big round brake release. You know, again, this is back of an era when all the individual manufacturers kind of had their own switch gear and look. I mean, now they're all sort of buying it out of the same parts bin and it doesn't look nearly as unique, but uh, in this era it did. I also love these... Um, uh, vents that you twist to aim at you, very much like on a 747 or something. Uh, just absolutely love them. Uh, the lumber in the car, all very cool, was made by German craftsmen at the time. Let me go to a wide angle. Um, and uh, nice and shiny on this one. You got a little glove box over here, which, you know, has a place to put crap. I don't know why it has a phone cord there. I think it's for the uh, it's a subwoofer level for the box. So uh, down here, you got more switches. That's your rear light. This is your antenna. Uh, this is your power sunroof, which is quite large in this thing. Works very well. Uh, rear defrost, uh, climate control, automatic, all the lovely German indecipherable hieroglyphics that I love. Uh, this one, again, has a Pioneer radio that... <sighs> nothing wrong with having a modern radio and the old one's still with it and it's all been done properly so i get why you leave it uh you've got an ashtray here because of course people smoked then uh, mercedes gated shifter um which was uh, a safety feature even before audi 5000s killed everybody uh you know you couldn't just pull it out of park without moving it over to the 
uh, right to move it back. Uh, the window switches, all of these are serviceable. So, I mean, you can actually take the switches apart, clean them, replace the springs, do what you need to do to make them work, and put them back in. I mean, this was such a forever car. Um, and, and nothing like it again today. Uh, power mirror switch, uh, fader for the why it was there, I don't know, but there it is. Uh, up here, pretty standard day-night mirror. Uh, you got a couple of, um, uh, whatever the hell you call them, sun visors with cocaine mirrors in them. Nice, so Mrs. Smith can powder her nose on the way to the country club, and uh, everything lovely. So, uh, I tell you what, let's... Uh, let me pause for a second because I see Peter coming up behind me and then we'll go for a spin. So bear with me one moment. All right, away we go. I don't know why the low fuel indicator, I actually looked it up last night. It could be a bad ground or the sending unit, but that shouldn't be on while the car has fuel in it uh, above and beyond, you know, anything close to empty. So, uh, and I tell you what, I'm about to hit the sun. So let me pause here. That was quick. And then we'll take a... Uh, Pick it up again when I hang her right up there. Bear with me a minute. All right, so away we go. Uh, that turbo gives you pretty good power. And again, that's what Americans needed to make these things more accessible. Um, you know, the naturally aspirated diesels just didn't have enough pep to keep up with traffic and make them happy. The turbo diesels did. Uh, you can see that hood star, the Mercedes emblem leading the way. Love it. Very traditional. Glinting off the sun at night. Nice indication from the gauges. Incredible feel from the wheel. Lovely braking feel. Uh, it also feels substantial and heavy while at the same time not being too heavy. Uh, again, just an absolute masterpiece uh, of engineering. Um, I mean, you're talking, look, here's the thing about this car. You're talking about a West German workforce who put this thing together with an enormous R&D budget for Mercedes-Benz, you know, at a time when they knew the prestige of their company and even to some extent, uh, the acceptance and prestige of their, uh, com uh country was like company and country both, um, you know, they needed to make the best car in the world. And frankly, by all accounts, they pulled it off. I mean, uh, these guys were at the top of their game and just built an incredible machine that still has legs today. I mean, it's considered a classic, but by some people, they say, man, it's just too, it's too good a car <laughs> to be a classic. It's too much. You go to any third world country today, these things are still running around because they cannot be killed. They are just that good. Um, absolutely amazing vehicles. I love them, always have. And uh, I suppose if I ever was on a desert island and had to pick one car, you know, to have and use and drive around, uh, probably the 123 would be pretty damn close to the top of the list. I mean, they just didn't make a better piece. So uh, I got to go back and pick up Peter. He's like, anyone who gets within like 20 feet of him, he puts to work. And he's done that to me now. So I've got to uh, go back and grab him and give him a lift into town. Uh, but uh, So that's going to kind of kill the highway drive. But anyway, I appreciate you guys having a look very, very much. Uh, we're going to have some fun. Keep going. Keep finding stuff. Thanks again to Dave for supplying this car. And we will see you with the next one. Take care.